Um, Tessa and um, Katrina persuaded me to talk about research and policy initiatives that made a difference and gave me the opportunity to go back a bit. This is just some declarations which you can see later on if you want to. Um, so I thought I'd talk about um, various things. I'd talk about clinical research because, uh, clinical practice, because that's, I mean, I'm a GP. I mean, I've been a GP for nearly 40 years in Muir House in Edinburgh. And I mean, my experience and my driving force is patients, what people say to you. And, and I think that's true for all of you. And certainly the discussions that have been going on over the last couple of years um, around the, 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 uh, the new strategy have been all about patient empowerment, listening to people, developing policies that are appropriate for people in communities and things like that. So, so that's where I come from. And, and so I'm going to start off on that. And then I'm going on to what I call pragmatic research. And this is Pragmatic is a word that the Dutch use very frequently when they mean it's, it's just an action. It's something doing stuff. Um, and you build it, you, you call it research, but actually it's, it's very, it's very, um, motivated by actions, which is great. And then I'll talk about uh, research projects that others have done, of course, in national policy. I mean, I mean, I hope you can see some of these slides at the back, and you probably can't read the text, but don't worry about that. I'll explain. I mean, this is this is the sort of thing that we see in the surgery, um, the sort of the sort of cases that we see. This is not very clear from the back, I'm sure, but this is a young woman covered with injection sites, not only in her hands but in her groin and her, on her arms and all over the place. You know, 20 year old female. I mean, really distressing for you know for her, but also distressing to see cases like this coming into your surgery. You know, people desperately needing help. Um, older guys with these femoral vein injection sites. I mean, this chap can inject in the dark. He can inject uh, heroin um, in the middle of the night in the dark without even looking because he's got a sinus, a tract going into his femoral vein. I mean, a very powerful indicator of long-term drug use. Um, and ethylphenidate injections, this ghastly drug that we saw in 2014 caused a lot of problems and some deaths and amputations and People walked into the surgery with things like this frequently, and they do still to this day. Um, these, some of these healed up, some of them got better. Desperate injection sites, you know, things that people, you know, why would you inject in your foot if you weren't pretty desperate? Um, and clear examples of self-neglect, you know, youngish woman, you know, with a mouth looking like that, I mean, completely neglecting herself. And then, of course, all the other things that we see, we see hepatitis. This is just to indicate the topic of hepatitis C. Hepatitis is something we see. We see new cases. We, we don't often see seroconversion illnesses, but we see new cases. We get new positive tests still. Um, and we have a caseload of people untreated still. And of course, our historic baggage of HIV in Edinburgh, um, which still rumbles on to this day. And I'll come back to this in a minute. But these are powerful indicators of stress, distress, problems in the community. And these drive policy, I think, more than almost anything else. Um, and of course, the AIDS thing uh, was all about communities. It wasn't just about people injecting drugs. It wasn't just about a bunch of train spotting style kids. This was about communities, children with AIDS. And we had several children in our practice who had AIDS, one or two died. Um, so it was spreading out. And that's what energized policy, of course, and big numbers coming up. Um, this, you won't be able to read this from the back, and it doesn't matter because it's just a list. I mean, this is a case uh, from my practice, just chosen, not at random, but just a drug user, who, a 46-year-old man, a list of really serious health problems, um, ranging from injecting drugs and long-standing methadone treatment um, to anthrax. He had anthrax and recovered from anthrax from injecting. He had pulmonary embolus, pulmonary infarcts. He's got left ventricular dysfunction. He's got heart disease. He's got epilepsy. And he's got a whole load of medications at the bottom there that we're prescribing for him. Really complex cases. And here's a, a lady, a 50-year-old lady, who actually presented on the day uh, with his bottom thing, the bottom uh, uh, topic, which is, you won't be able to see in the back, is for hormone replacement therapy. She's menopausal. And that was her presenting symptom. And, you know, you sort of say, well, hold on a minute. Um, you know, by the way, you've got all these other problems we need to treat first. Untreated hepatitis C, still injecting cocaine and heroin. Um, alcohol problems, you know, recent pulmonary infections, very complex cases again. You won't be able to see this. I mean, this is just meant to illustrate patients' perspectives. And these bubbles are quotes. And this is from the National Forum on Drug-Related Deaths when we had that wonderful volunteers forum, uh, which helped us out um, and um, told us, you know, gave us feedback from, uh, from people who were using drugs. 
And the, the codes here are, are, are terrible. They really are awful. They say doctors don't like them. They, don't, they, they say they, they can't treat them. They call them uh, irresponsible. They, they stigmatize them. I mean, they, these, are, these are straightforward from patients. And they cut down your methadone. So you've taken some heroin, your toxicology is positive, your methadone gets cut, or you get told to go away and come back and work on your motivation. I mean, really, really terrible. Um, and this next slide, again, you won't be able to see it, but this is the doctor's perspectives. And this is taken from a group of, of doctors who didn't actually treat drug users. And the reasons they didn't is because they said they were difficult, they were problematic, they, they lied, cheated, they didn't turn up for appointments, they were untreatable, it was a specialist. And, and one quote is that, well, we don't have any in our practice. And I thought, well, I bet you don't. Um, and so, uh, but prescribing, so... Uh, the history of pre prescribing is complicated, and, um, and I think it is important to remember we prescribe a lot of stuff that causes harms and causes risks, certainly, and we don't do it with the intention of causing harm, but it's, it's risky stuff. We're in a difficult territory prescribing controlled drugs in big doses to people who are not the, the best judges and not well controlled is dangerous. Um, and we have this list of drugs, and some of them in red are drugs that have been taken out of the pharmacopoeia because of a frank, really excessive abuse, like trazolam and thoridazine. And the trouble is all these drugs interact with each other. So the, you, know, you prescribe six different drugs to a patient and they all cause cardiac side effects. So, they, you know, so the complications are enormous. I put this up just to move on to the next sort of topic. I mean, this is the uh, Irving Welsh's fantastic story, isn't it, which we all learned an awful lot from. Uh, but the, this was in The Guardian a couple of years ago. But it was there to illustrate that this isn't what's happening now. And um, what we're seeing now is an older group of drug users. Um, and of course, these, familiars, these figures are very familiar to all of you, um, causing, cause, causing concern. Um, and this slide is slightly out of date. It's 2016. The 2018 figures are really illustrating what I hope to illustrate, is that drug deaths have overtaken alcohol deaths for the first time this year. Um, and, um, so we've got, a, we've got a real problem here, and as the minister says, this is uh, what we're trying to address now. This is just from our own cohort study, Edinburgh Addiction Cohort, which is uh, a group of 800 patients registered with my practice. And you can see this trend line shows the trend in drug-related deaths. And the blue columns, the very high blue column in the 1990s, is all about HIV, which largely went away in terms of death. But the conference in Lisbon recently, which some of you were at, uh, really highlighted, and this was a, a slide taken from Louisa Dagenhart and others, um, mega analysis of lots of data around the, around the world, um, just showing that actually poisoning, that left-hand block, is 32% of all the drug-related deaths. If you add in other stuff, like other non-communicable diseases, that top 13%, HIV, all these other causes of drug-related death. We really have more than 3,000 drug-related deaths, probably in Scotland, um, per year. So we, this is, we're just, uh, this is a tip of some sort of iceberg. So moving on to my pragmatic research, well, this was uh, my, our prescribing problem. We prescribed a lot of dihydrocodeine in the early 1980s because methadone was sort of beneath the radar. It wasn't approved of. It wasn't in the national guidelines for long-term use. And we kind of got drawn into it. And we got criticized heavily, of course, you know, by colleagues and, and um, uh, by the Home Office. We used to get regular visits by the inspectorate. And they said we had to stop prescribing dihydrocodeine. So we thought we'd do a trial. And we did a trial. And we recruited um, uh, 235 patients. Um, and we followed them up for 42 months, 94% follow-up rate. Now, I don't believe anybody could beat that at four years, nearly four years to have 94% follow-up rate. So it showed retention and treatment. That was the first thing it showed. But it also showed no difference in other various outcomes between that and methadone treatment. So here was our justification for continuing to prescribe an alternative to methadone. Uh, going along with that, our research with Joe, Joe Kimber and all from New South Wales on... Um, uh, childhood exposure, as you know, now uh, adverse childhood experiences is a huge topic, of course, and, and we identified that in 2010 and published that in the BMJ. Uh, Drug-related deaths, or this is about injection cessation. So what we wanted to do in this study is study whether or not people stopped injecting. So it was particularly about injecting. It wasn't about stopping using drugs, because people just don't stop using drugs easily. But we showed that with treatment, and the blue curve there is no treatment, and the top curve there is five years plus treatment, 
you were much more likely to stop injecting drugs. And the same happened for deaths. You were much more likely to die if you didn't get treatment. And this is over a time period of, of several years. So being out of treatment is a risk factor, a huge risk factor for death. Um, so moving on to research projects. Well, most of what we know, or a lot of what we know about drugs, comes from historic um, information, the, the famous Lexington experience, which Ian's nodding his head there, he knows all about the narcotics farm. Um, and this really set the, in, not in stone, but it gave us our, our, our knowledge of what happens to drug users. And this was Lexington Prison in Kentucky, which was set up in 1935 and ran for 40 years. And the prospect or the project was designed to find out why people use drugs, find an enduring treatment and cure them. And uh, this was a, a therapy farm uh, in custody. And a lot of the treatments were by today's standards unethical and, um, and rather dubious and uh, not terribly effective. And, and the whole project was deemed to be not effective. And 90%, as it says at the bottom there, stopped, uh, continued or started using drugs again as soon as they were released. But the follow-up study... Um, in New York, 20 years later, was really interesting. So 20 years follow-up on this cohort of people who'd been incarcerated, many of whom were jazz musicians, were people from theatre and different group from our group. But the, the follow-up study 20 years on, and in red there, it showed that 23% had died. So, you know, quite a large percentage had died. 25% um, were still known to be using drugs, but a large percentage were in some sort of controlled, abstinent state. So here we are with the early research showing some really useful findings, which resonates down the years. Um, and we still have, I guess, um, a lot of findings that are very similar. Um, after a long period of time, a lot of people stop using, a lot of people continue to use, a lot are dead. Um, so it's, it, this is a snapshot of what we can expect to see. So the natural history of drug dependency, and I won't go through this, uh, but I mean, but at the top there, I've put a very important general rule. The majority of people who use drugs come to very little harm. And I think we tend to forget that. I mean, we tend to see those people that I showed you the photographs at the beginning. These are the people that come to harm. And there is a big group of people, maybe 10% of all the drug users come to some sort of significant harm. And so really what we're talking about in clinical practice is the people that come to harm. But the majority of people actually probably don't come to a lot of harm or it's temporary or they get over it sort of thing. Um, back on treatment, I mean, this is uh, Rosie Cornish and Matthew Hickman's um, famous study on the efficacy of treatment in preventing deaths. And the important message from this, it's a, it's a, a delightfully simple slide, this. Um, it shows that over time, and the bottom axis is, uh, is, um, is weeks, is 100 weeks, over time, um, the chances of dying from uh, opiate substitute treatment gets less and less and less, the, the protective value of drug-related treatment increases as the, year, as the year goes on. And it doesn't plateau until about a year. The first uh, few months are risky, methadone uh, treatment particularly. Um, onset of methadone treatment is, is associated with an increased risk. But as time goes on, the, the risk gets less and less. But, you, but it's long-term treatment again. Um, David Nutt's famous paper on the harms caused by, uh, by drugs showing all these different drugs, and you can't read them, but cannabis and, and mushrooms and LSD and all that stuff is at the right-hand end. The blue columns show the harm to the individual and the red to others, to communities, to families, to... And there's a complex calculation giving these totals. But you can see in the left-hand column, um, heroin, cocaine, and alcohol cause a lot of harms to people, but they also cause a lot of harms to communities and families and individuals. This is a paper which you can't read, of course, um, and this is Nikki Kalk and, and uh, John Strang. And it's a, it's a sort of discussion paper, really, about lessons we could learn from history. And I think it's really interesting. It's a really interesting reference, and it summarizes quite nicely, I think, the risks. Um, and it starts off by saying, don't let a good crisis go to waste. Um, the message being that policy changes when there's a crisis. And here we are with our crisis of drug-related deaths and urgent changing in policy. Um, HIV, dramatic changes in policy. Um, so, uh, and, and there are a lot of other uh, very important messages there. And this is um, Jerry um, uh, McCartney, who some of you work with, I'm sure, at Public Health Scotland now. I was showing the life expectancy in Scotland has begun to plateau. You know, it's gone down for the first time um, in recorded history. So here we are, we've got a crisis. And, and this is blamed 
very firmly on political austerity and poor drugs policy, from, uh, mainly from Westminster government. Um, and of course, Michael Marmot's famous paper, our famous publication, the, the Marmot Review, the Strategic Review of Inequalities in England, reminding us it's all about inequalities. And the red says 40% of all influences in health are socioeconomic, um, and that has the largest impact in health. I mean, this is, this is important evidence, isn't it? Um, okay, so um, drug users have been framed. This is what I suggest to you, that um, they're characterized as reckless, they're characterized as indulgent in violence and blamed for crime and everything. But in fact, they're victims of some sort of poverty and inequalities. And, and the, the result, uh, again, the result of prejudicial regi uh, legislation means that they're excluded from treatment, like I said, with our GP attitudes. And, and there is a resistance to progress. There's a resistance to treatment. There's a resistance to innovation, as we can see from our, the traumas and difficulties we've had setting up the safer injecting rooms. Um, so there's a, the results of prejudicial. And I'm just going to move on quickly to important reports. And there are a whole list of reports. I mean, I used to collect them, and I've got a bookcase full of reports. Um, but there are some that stand out, I think. And of course, United Nations legislation is critically important to understand our own legislation because all, all domestic legislation comes from the United Nations agreements, the particular 1961 conventions. Um, but our own reports in Scotland, McClelland's report, tremendously important. And then, uh, the, of course, uh, uh, the UK followed on, ACMD followed on producing similar reports a year or two later. This um, you can't read, but this is uh, the first hundred patients in Scotland, which I think is really interesting history. It's only 1973. I mean, I don't think 1973 is that long ago, uh, but it's um, the first hundred cases in Scotland. Um, and and the, the text there, the abstract, really says these guys are untreatable. They're very difficult. They, you know, we, we didn't have a strategy, even though we'd set up a, a treatment centre in Edinburgh in 1968. Um, Again, I apologise for the quality of this slide, but in this on the left there is the initial Orange Guidelines published in 1984, um, which were about 13 pages long and basically said that really there wasn't a medical treatment here. Um, methadone, if you wanted to prescribe it, prescribe it for a couple of weeks, get people off drugs and then move them into social services. And, and that was about it. And the McClelland report on the right here, again, uh, about 10 pages, completely changing everything, revolutionizing the whole thing uh, because of AIDS, because of HIV infection. Um, and 1986, seeing upscale methadone, upscale needles and syringes, get people into treatment, retain them in treatment, social services get involved, prisons have to pay attention. Um, huge, a huge turnaround, dramatic turnaround just within the space of a couple of years. Followed on as we have at the present day, in the wake of our current crisis with the Social Services Committee, Rennie Short and her committee of, of ghastly backbenchers came up to talk to us in Edinburgh and really didn't listen and didn't pay much attention, but actually, funnily enough, produced quite an interesting report. And then our own, our last task force minister, we've had a task force before, 1994, um, the, um, the government then urgently convened a task force and there's a recurring theme here, and we spent a lot of time trying to convince the minister that, that we have an evidence-based treatment in methadone at the time, but also other opiate substitute treatment. And we did get it into this document, um, uh, but um, it's a recurring struggle to get our evidence base into policy. The ACMD report, of course, 2000, which set up the current um, standards for drug-related deaths, um, chaired by Griff Edwards, who was the, the doyen of, um, of research in, uh, for many years and the editor of Addictions, um, and accepted by ministers. And we moved us into this era we have of having a proper system of recording drug-related deaths. Policy documents in England and Scotland, the Scottish one, again, a bit of a revolution, all about inclusion, all about recovery, all about um, uh, looking at the bigger picture and taking in the bigger community, not just individuals who come to their GPs with these awful um, complications, but you know, bigger, uh, the, the, the drug users that are, are much more likely to do well. Um, and on to our present report, um, and our guidelines, our current guidelines, the orange guidelines, 
fifth, sixth or seventh, I can't remember, iteration of these guidelines, now 230 pages um, of you know, fairly complex text, uh, evidence-based, very strong on evidence, very strong on, on um, practical advice and guidelines for clinicians. And, um, and, but I think this is more than just a guideline. I keep saying to people it's more than just a guideline because when we get into trouble, the lawyers and the politicians and everybody looks to this to sort of say, well, you know, have we done this right or have we done this wrong? And there isn't really another textbook like the guidelines. And so this is a really important reference document as well as a clinical manual. Um, just not necessarily being terribly critical, but I just couldn't help myself looking in these documents. And on the left is um, the road to recovery and the, uh, the rights respect and recovery. Just to see, you know, if you do this trick where you can search for words, you know, you can, you can find out how many times they're mentioned. And you can see the harm reduction in the road to recovery is mentioned five times. Now, that doesn't sound like very much, but that was a breakthrough. That was the first time in my, that I've looked at in the international literature that harm reduction is mentioned anywhere in a national document. A bit like the McClelland Report. This was a bit of a game changer. Uh, it mentioned harm reduction for the first time. Sadly, it only mentions harm reduction seven times in the current document. Recovery is mentioned 144 times in the Road to Recovery document and 169 times in the present document. Maintenance, methadone, substitution, virtually not mentioned at all. Although, I mean, I, I do understand that it's mentioned in, you know, in other terms like um, uh, getting people into treatment and there's a lot of work going on to, to get people into treatment. But, you know, I, I think we've got to concentrate on getting our evidence base into policy. Um, so just moving on finally to national policy. How am I doing? Two minutes. Three minutes. Three. Thank you. Um, national policy. Right. Can we deal with national policy in three minutes? Um, well, are we in a new era? I, I mean, I, I don't know. You know, it's, the trouble with being old is that you, you, you've seen lots of new eras. Um, but uh, we've got several indications of policy failure, haven't we? We've got several uh, problems here. We've got multiple drug problems, cocaine and heroin all over the place. Um, we've got uh, this rising death rate. We've got a and uh, busy with people with drug-related problems. We've got our little epidemic of HIV infection, a major uh, indicator of something. And, and we have, um, we're, needing, we're needing radical change and we're needing radical measures, including a thought towards decriminalization and um, all these things that are happening elsewhere. And the reason we have to think about that is because they are happening elsewhere. And, you know, Colorado and Washington and, and um, California and the Uruguay and, and we talk about Portugal, but Luxembourg is talking now about legalizing cannabis for personal use, for recreational use. Um, upsetting most of the European Union by by going um, down this line, but I mean they were going to do it. I think they are going to do it. So there's change happening, um, and but we have a resistance to change clearly in Westminster. I mean this is a little bit of an old quote, 2014, but it's still um, the rhetoric still there and the judgment about um, time limited in method and all these stupid ideas um, are still resonating a little bit. And this was the Home Office Minister's report, or a rather blunt reply to the, our Scottish um, uh, Member of Parliament asking about safer injecting rooms, saying there's no intention of doing it, and there's no sign of any change, despite the, everybody else in Europe doing it. This, this is um, a, a slide which appealed to me. Um, I don't know, you won't be able to read it, but it says this is businessmen talking to each other, and the chairman saying, granted, it would have saved countless lives, but to what end? And, you know, I do think there's an element of, you know, of, of priorities and economic priorities rumbling along here. So progress and lack of progress, well, I mean, in my lifetime, in my career, which, you know, it's, I know it's a long career, but it's not that long, um, the World AIDS Conference in Vancouver was just an extraordinary experience when David Ho announced he had a treatment for HIV infection, a real breakthrough. Um, uh, hepatitis C virus, previously known as non-A, non-B, and a bit of a mystery, was identified in 1990. We now have a treatment, 99, I don't know how many percent, 96 percent cure rate. I mean, phenomenal. So two new viruses in my lifetime being identified. We've now got cures for both of them, or not cures, but most of them. And that's, that's extraordinary. But at the bottom here, a lack of progress, antagonism to medically assisted treatment goes on. 
um, austerity targeted at mental health and policy and uh, cuts particularly affecting drug use and mental health and the policy paralysis. And just finally, just to you know, raise this spectre of the internet, you know, which we all have to, but this is really just to remind me to, to say that new drugs are all over the place. New drugs are available and they're available on the internet and it shows over, over years uh, the, the supply increasing um, in all parts of the world. Um, just acknowledgement and thanks, I don't need to tell you about that. Uh, but there's a quote from Bruce Springsteen. I don't, I don't know if he ever said that. It's a nice quote. Thanks, Katrina. <laughs>